Okay. I'm going to start recording now. Yeah. So opening the February 18th meeting at 12.06 a.m. for um, the subcommittee on the bylaw review. So um, both Leroy and I had that we were around page 26. I think we had just started on talking about bank. Um, and I think it might actually be good for us to have sort of a general overall conversation. And just so that you guys know, I was supposed to meet with town council this morning. We, town council and I, I think are on like page 16 at this point. Um, because it's really heavy to go through with council word by word, but um, he had to cancel this morning for a emer personal emergency. So um, we haven't gotten very much further, but I anticipate, I sent him the whole document and I anticipate that um, at some point we're gonna have sort of a longer session to go through things. Um, I just wanted to just preface this and I think it might be a good chance for us to have an overall discussion on some of these issues. So if you look at our bylaw, and I'm, I'm just starting here um, where the, the standards for inland wetlands begin in the bylaw, there's a preamble. This is, and it's the same exact format as the Wetlands Protection Act. There's a preamble which talks about um, the specific resource area and um, what, um, characteristics it has that basically um, tie into the interests of the Wetlands Protection Act. So it'll talk a lot about public private water supply, protection of fisheries, flood control, storm damage, all those, those um, eight interests of the Wetland Protection Act, seven inland interests of the Wetland Protection Act. Um, and do you guys know what those are? Okay, so it's, let me see if I can remember all of them. It's um, public and private water supply, groundwater, storm damage prevention, prevention of pollution, protection of fisheries. I'm missing one, but that, I mean, generally what it means is like the reason that the Wetland Protection Act exists is to protect these general public interests. Um, and so we can, we can talk a little bit more about those as time goes on, but what's really interesting, and I had this queued up, let me see if I can, um, do this um, pull it up. Oh, I guess I didn't have it queued to the right spot. So um, let me see if I can get my finger on it really. Quickly. Um, so it, it ties into 10.55 of the Wetland Protection Act. So it's 310 CMR 10.55, which is banks. And once I get there, um, what you'll see is, so I'm putting them side by side so that you can see um, what we're working with here. Um, let me just shrink it so you can see it. Hopefully you can see, oh, it won't let me make that pane smaller. It's really annoying that it won't let me make that smaller. You just change your view. <sighs> the little three bar drop down next to download, you can maybe change to not. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So, <laughs> teamwork. So, if you see these side by side, um, <clears throat> and this is, oh, I'm looking at um, BBW and not banks. But it's basically repetitive, and there's a couple minor changes to the language, but for the most part, they're, it, the only difference that I could find was it, said, it lists wildlife habitat first. So banks, and, it, and also are likely to be, um, banks are likely to be significant to public and private water supply, groundwater supply, flood control, storm damage prevention, prevention of pollution, protection of fisheries and wildlife habitat. So this is, and I don't know who made these changes, banks are significant to wildlife habitat is listed first, public, uh, public or private water supply, groundwater. So you can see they're very similar. And, um, and I just wanted to point that out because for the most part, 
each resource area that's listed um, of the inland resource areas follows almost the exact same text of the Wetland Protection Act with a couple exceptions. And it's, it's a little odd, um, honestly, that it follows that format. And I'll just, I'm just gonna zoom in. I'm gonna maximize this and zoom in a little bit so you can see this. So <clears throat> we shouldn't just copy and paste from the Wetland Protection Act in our bylaw. It's really not, it's not a good practice to use what it, it adds a lot of text and also what makes it very difficult under our bylaw is to distinguish how our bylaw is different from the Wetland Protection Act. If all we're doing is copying and pasting and doing a couple little word changes here and there, it makes it very difficult to know how does our bylaw go above and beyond state law as far as protection of these resource areas. So, um, one of the things that the town council, or I should say our town attorney recommended was that we have this statement um, at some of these headings that say something to the effect of, unless otherwise specified therein or herein, um, preamble definitions, presumption and general performance standards are the, uh, under the State Wetland Protection Act shall apply. And, and then our bylaw, beyond that would basically, this is kind of my recommendation to you guys, would state very explicitly where our bylaw goes above and beyond state law to protect these resource areas. And in, in a situation where we deny a permit or we're in an appeal, it makes it very easy to call out where areas where um, a given project is, is out of compliance with our bylaw because we can point directly to, well, you know, these standards are more strict under our bylaw than under the Wetlands Protection Act. So I wanted to throw that out there and that would really require going through um, the um, each resource area section by section to see where there's additional protections provided. And also I think it would give us an opportunity to say, where are there holes in this, where we need to sort of fill in and um, add additional explanation for um, what other interests we're protecting or, um, you know, specific conditions that we want to, like performance standards that we wanted to implement. Um, but I want to just kind of put that up for discussion amongst you two to talk about what your thoughts are on that. If you like it in its current um, configuration where it's like copy paste with a couple word changes here and there, or if you'd like it to be sort of more in line with what I was thinking, I just want to get your perspective and opinion on it. Roy, want to go first? Uh, yeah. I say it sounds like you and council have the right idea about the heading and then just breaking out our parts separately. I like what you're saying about clarity when we're calling out bylaw, not infractions, but uh, permits denied. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that would make a lot of these sections for us significantly smaller. Like this mm -hmm. first one off the yeah. top, thanks. I mean, our, really our protection difference is only there's only one significant difference, right? And that's the distance, the 100 to 200. Um, <laughs> that's a great question, Leroy. Um, so I've gone through um, some of these and we can, we can go through, we can start going through a little bit on some of my comments as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, for example, wildlife habitat is one of the interests in our bylaw that is not, in the Wetland Protection Act um, or in the aid interests of the Wetland Protection Act. So that's literally that one, that one statement, wildlife habitat is like a little insertion. So, you know, if, for example, we could state like as the town attorney recommended unless otherwise specified here, um, all of the items in the Wetland Protection Act shall apply. And then say in the preamble with the exception of A, wildlife habitat is an additional interest that we 
consider um, banks to be uh, significant to or something like that. And then so on and so forth, like specifying those specific items. But you're absolutely right. It would cut down on the text and it would shorten the document significantly if we did that. And make it clear to, clearer to the public. I really like that part. Mm -hmm. I know you're yeah. just spitballing there, but uh, when we're doing the wording, I don't know, do we, is it, will we call it an exception like that? Will we say with the exception of, or will we say more like in addition to? Right, exactly. Yep. But yeah, those are my general thoughts. What about you, Michelle? Yeah, I think that's all very sound logic. Um, I definitely don't want, like, I guess it'll just probably take a lot of time to sort out what's the same and what's different. So I imagine it'll be more of a time commitment to do that. Um, so nothing gets lost in the, in the um, simplification. Exactly. Especially, hopefully not wildlife habitat. Um, right. Yeah, I, really, I do really like that idea. And I guess probably we just want to be certain with council that our, unless otherwise specified, includes all the legal legalese that it needs to to cover everything. So there's no, I don't know, pinholes in it that. Um, yeah. 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 And I mean, I think that we should also talk about issues where we want to incorporate things um, as well. So I think that that's great. And um, I think as long as I sort of have a general sense of what you guys are thinking, then when I go to rewrite this, which is going to be really uh, quite the process, um, I will, we're basically going to have three documents. We're going to have this document, which is sort of the markup. We're, we'll have the old version, which is the original, and then we'll have the new version, which is kind of like the rewrite, um, which when that comes, when it comes time to, to look at that, it's going to look very different. Um, I just have one follow-up question to that. Yeah, is course. that the method that other towns bylaws follow or is, is there a general consensus as to how people handle the, the differences yeah. and how they're laid out? That's a great question, Michelle. Um, I will, I will look into that um, for you and, and report back to you on that. Um, yeah, I always like finding like a good exemplary um, yeah. document and, yep. you know, seeing what people did right. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and every town is a little different um, as far as format is concerned, but I do agree with you. And um, I mean, the other, and I know I mentioned this already a couple times, but I think that there are p potential ways that we could make these, these resource area sections quite a bit stronger. Um, and, and also because there, we know more about wetlands now and their functions than maybe when this was originally written. Like for example, the fact that wetlands are considered to be carbon sinks, you know, like something like that, like that's something that would probably not be mentioned in here at all, because right. it's like based on new research, we know more about their functions and particularly around climate change and things like that. So um, we may want to incorporate, I'm not necessarily saying we want, wouldn't want to incorporate more interests. Maybe we would, I don't know. <laughs> we can come back to that, but um, there may be other elements to wetlands in terms of functions that they serve that we would want to call out as being important and relevant. Yeah, I'm 100% behind bringing it up to like our current knowledge about climate change preparedness and function. <laughs> and um, we have some, we have some good knowledge on the Conservation Commission to help us do that too. But yep. let's bring it up to date. <laughs> That, that all sounds good. Um, so, um, let me see here. I know I got through page 30. Um, also, Erin, Michelle just reminded me when she was talking about other towns, 
Mm -hmm. Is our thing about having a town only permit or a letter permit type thing kind of dead in the water until council talks about it with other people for a while, or is that moving along in the background? Yeah, I I do need to follow up with council. That was one of our questions that we had discussed at the at our last meeting, um, and it's definitely it's come up it's come up again already in terms of you know, questions um, of how to handle it. Like recently at the last meeting, we had a gentleman come before the board, um, 21 East Hadley Road for a um, electrical utility pole in his front yard, just a temporary one. But he was, he was over 50 feet from the mean annual high water line of the Fort River. He was, he was over 50 feet from a wetland. So he would have qualified as a minor activity under the Wetlands Protection Act, but it was only, it was only um, relevant under our bylaw. And so that came through sort of as an informal request. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's that component where it's like, what do we do for, for really basic ones like that? Do we make people, and, and I am actually making him file a request for determination for that. I mean, he's putting in another piling as well for a little addition to his sun porch, but those two items being the only two items that he's doing on his property, um, you know, it's, it's a lot to have them hire a wetland consultant to, you know, flag the bank, flag the wetlands, um, get it all on a map, get it all on a plan, and then, you know, put up erosion controls for two pilings. It's a lot to ask of somebody and then, you know, $300 for a legal ad, notifying all the butters within 300 feet. So I'm hopeful that we can come up with something, um, but town council will get back to me on that. Um, So there was a couple things here um, that we, I wanted to just to talk about with you guys. So here we're talking about bank um, and we're gonna get into to Riverfront as well. Um, one issue that we've had again and again is people wanting to put in um, bridges like footbridges or other bridges and not file a notice of intent application. Um, and this has been in the riverfront area as well as in buffer zone. And here we're talking about buffer zone to bank. Um, my philosophy on that has always been that anybody who's putting in a bridge of any kind needs to file a notice of intent application. Um, and, and the commission has definitely backed that up quite a bit. Um, like Amherst College had come through um, right before I went on maternity leave, Amherst College came through proposing multiple bridges um, in their sanctuary, which is uh, south of College Street. And the commission basically denied the permit and said, you guys have to file a notice of intent. So they're coming back. But I didn't know if, if somewhere in these regulations, we wanted to specify that specific item. Um, and I think that including it potentially, um, I'm not sure exactly where in the document we would have that, but um, <clears throat> I wanted to see what you guys' feelings were on that, if that was something you'd be in favor of including. I guess I'm happy to specify. I just don't, I don't really know why we have to. Because like you said, when it comes up, uh, we let people know and that's been fun and it's pretty clearly an alteration to a resource area so well i, I think it's kind of self-explanatory and you're right it does come up a lot but i kind of feel like we might just have to keep explaining it but i don't know that's me <laughs> michelle i don't know are you gonna respond Aaron? Well, there's, there's really two things that I'd really love to have rolled into our regulations that require notice of intent. One of them is bridges, any type of bridge work and any work within 50 feet of a resource area. Um, 
and part of the reason for this is because yeah you're you're absolutely right Leroy it does require conversations but I'll give you some examples so in the case of Amherst College it was a, a former staff person who worked for the town of Amherst who was advising them that, oh you can just file a request for determination and then there was other folks who were um, familiar with the Wetland Protection Act who said that they should be able to do it with a request for determination and and that's you know that's fine for those folks to have those opinions but they really guided the applicant to file a request for determination and in Amherst so <clears throat> Ordinarily in most towns, let's say they don't have a bylaw for a request for determination application, you don't have to notify a butters, you only have to post a legal ad. In Amherst, you do have to notify a butters, that's a requirement under the bylaw. So it's a lot for somebody to file the permit, notify a butters, post a legal ad, you know, do all their paperwork to submit it only to come to the Conservation Commission and hear, sorry, you should have filed a notice of intent application and then they've got to go through the whole process all over again. Um, I, in the case of that Amherst College application, I must have had 20 conversations with them saying, file a notice of intent, file a notice of intent, and they kept on with the request for determination. That is true. Through, through, the, through the whole <laughs> thing. And then at the end, ended up being told you need to file a notice of intent. And it was really tough. It was a really tough situation because it felt like we were fighting it at least me, I felt like I was fighting against the current on it the entire time. And um, it would have just made it a lot easier if I could point to something in the regs that substantiated what I was asking. Um, and then the other one was, you know, 50 feet, within 50 feet of a resource area. So I'll give you an example on that. Let's say somebody's constructing a, a house within 50 feet of a wetland. They're most certainly going to be altering the wetland as a result of the work if you know, depending on how it's constructed, how careful they are, if vegetation's being removed, the existing conditions on the site, it might be a lawn and they're just, you know, putting in an erosion control and staying on existing lawn, but they might be doing a lot of tree clearing as well. And again, it was a, a consultant who does work with the town very frequently. There was a proposal for a garage that was going to be coming in. And this consulting firm told the applicant, oh, you can file a request for determination if you're within 40 feet and you'll be fine. And when the applicant contacted me and said, I'm in the process of filing a request for determination, I said, well, what is the work and what's the plan? And they explained it. And I said, well, you need a notice of intent for that. And they were like, well, we were told we could do it with an RDA. Um, again, two, two very important items which a lot of times get lost and applicants who aren't familiar with the process or sort of expectations, they might not check in with staff first, they might be re relying on outside advice from a, a consultant. Um, so just wanted to respond and give you some examples. Yeah, I mean, so Leroy has a good point that it should this carry through based on the existing thing, but if it's a common kind of application, that's often a point of confusion and misery for the applicant and on you. Um, I guess I, I would support having like clarity. Um, yep. And also just to like sort of safeguard where we, if it's like a conversation with the commission, at least they go into it knowing what, I don't know, what to expect, or they have some structure to the project. I didn't even really think about that, Michelle. That's a very good point about continuity for the commissions over time. If it's clear, yeah. right, they know it's something easy to point back to. So, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's something I want to like just keep in mind is, you know, um, I'm comfortable with all the decisions we make, but just to like put some, you know, I don't know, longevity and perpetuity into, into this structure. Mm -hmm. um, while we have the chance to. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think those are all excellent points. Um, okay. Um, so I wanted to just talk about those while we were talking about bank, because I do think that they're, they're important. Um, yeah. So can I just, yeah, there's please. like a deletion of 200 feet of riverfront. Is that something we should look at or. 
I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but it just looks like a, is, is it yeah, the, those were edits that were made by, made by others. Um, and is it changing anything that we need to talk about, or is it like your superfluous information? That's just a redundant explanation. It just se it seems to go from 100 to 200 there. So I just wanted to make sure it wasn't something we should talk about. Um, so I think that what they were correcting here, there's a whole separate, there's a whole separate set of performance standards for Riverfront um, area. So Riverfront has its own general performance standards. So um, it's a little bit confusing because um, <laughs> we're getting deep in the reads with this. I don't, I don't need to no, no, it's take good. us down a rabbit hole. Okay. No, I no wanna... this is a good educational opportunity and I wanna talk about it because it's, it's very important. Um, okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about bank specifically. Um, and this is awesome for you guys to get a little bit of a, a deeper read into the Wetland Protection Act and also our local bylaw. So bank is on a stream, right? And it could be a perennial stream or an intermittent stream. And how bank is delineated is um, uh, um, mean annual high water line or first observable break in slope. Um, those are sort of like the definitions of how they are delineated. Now, um, if you think about um, a river, let's say the Mill River, we'll use Mill River as an example. If you guys have ever walked down at the Mill River um, uh, recreation area, if you ever look at the bank of a river, you can see where the river's flowing, right? And you can see that when the river's at its high point, there's a point of the river where there's a break, right? And there's no vegetation, but then all of a sudden there's vegetation. Do you know where I'm talking about? Do you know the, that line that I'm talking about? So when somebody goes out and they're flagging bank, that's what they're flagging. So a perennial river like the Mill River, you're gonna be flagging both sides of the, the bank on either side. Now with intermittent streams, this is a really interesting one. Now, his, over the history of my time doing this, when I first started as a conservation agent, intermittent streams didn't have two banks, which is really interesting. There was a center line that was mapped for an intermittent stream and they didn't do the individual banks. Now, over time, I believe with case law that that's changed, um, but it's a really important distinction with bank because Perennial streams at that first observable break and slope mean annual high water line is where the riverfront line begins. Okay. So, and the riverfront is an actual resource area. It's not a buffer zone, it's a resource area. And it should always be marked as such on any plan that comes before the Conservation Commission. So, that line where that break is from 200 feet extending um, uh, out from that line that is a resource area on a perennial stream. On an intermittent stream, that line is a buffer zone. Mm. Okay, so there, an in intermittent stream, the resource area is the stream itself. And on a, in a, for a perennial stream, it has a 400 foot wide resource area that surrounds it. So, um, I believe that the reason that that's crossed out is because, um, and, and this is, that it's a good point in the sense of, um, I think what you just called out there, Michelle, is important in the sense of, um, there, we're not specifying here perennial or intermittent. Um, and I think we need to. Because this is saying within 100 feet of the upper boundary of bank, um, the, the 100 feet of the upper boundary um, 
of an intermittent stream. And that should be spelled out specifically because if it's a perennial, and then of course, perennial streams have the 200 foot riverfront area. Now crossing that out here isn't going to change the fact that there's a riverfront area. There's a riverfront area regardless. I think from talking with Beth, the former wetlands administrator, some of these resource area definitions have a lot of issues. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important for us to do what the town attorney said in terms of referring to the Wetland Protection Act, but then being very specific about how we are more we're more stringent or have greater protections because um, it can become very unclear and especially for let's say an attorney who's very familiar with um, legal language could could find ways to say oh well wait a second you're saying bank here um, the 100 foot upper boundary of the bank well then that means that the riverfront area doesn't apply like the the outer riverfront area wouldn't apply here wouldn't be um uh you know count for performance standard under banks do you see what i'm saying so yeah, since yeah. it specifically says within 100 feet of the upper boundary of bank but it doesn't specify perennial or in intermittent somebody could make the argument that it's not going to impact the bank if they're in the outer 100 on a perennial stream or something to that effect. So we've just got to be really careful about some of this language and just check it and double check it. Um, but I think that that's a really, really interesting point. And I'm not entirely sure why that riverfront area was in there to begin there to begin with. Um, but I do think um, breaking it up into perennial or intermittent would be smart. <clears throat> So this is interesting here too under B. Um, so under bank, um, you can alter uh, up to 10% or 50 feet of the bank. Um, and you can actually alter beyond that if there's no adverse effects on wildlife habitat. Can you imagine altering more than 50% 50 feet of bank and it not having an effect on wildlife habitat. That's very, very interesting. Um, so here's probably where, so like in this section right here under D where it's talking about um, work on a stream crossing shall be presumed to meet the performance standards provided that the work is in compliance with the stream crossing standards, this would be a great place to have an insertion on the requirement for an NOI. Okay, so um, another sort of question that I had on this, <laughs> um, so for consistency's sake, um, I just want to come back to the Wetlands Protection Act for just a second. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't. Um, so I, I'm going to have to do a little bit more checking back and forth on this, but one of the things, so there's, there's bordering vegetated wetland is defined in here 10.55. Bordering vegetated wetlands means they have to border on something. So for example, if you have a wetland that's beside a river or, um, uh, I mean, that's really 
primarily where you see them is, is above rivers, alongside rivers. Um, and sometimes you'll see like really expansive, huge wetland systems, like as an example, like Lawrence Swamp, you'll have like the Plum Brook or the Hop Brook or something flowing through it. And then there's these huge wetland systems that surround them. But there's also isolated um, wetland systems. And um, in this case, so just for consistency sake, we have bank first, and then bordering vegetated wetlands are second under wetland protection. But then under our bylaw, we say vegetated wetlands bordering vegetated, uh, sorry, vegetated wetlands bordering and isolated. And so part of me wants to break up bordering vegetated wetlands so that it's consistent with the Wetland Protection Act and then have an entirely separate um, resource area listed as isolated because the, the Wetlands Protection Act does refer specifically to isolated vegetated wetlands separately. Um, and that needs like the Oxford comma on it also. I mean, just to split it, bordering and isolated. Well, that's an oxymoron anyway, but without the comma, it doesn't make any sense. Do you know, see what I'm saying? Bordering, uh, an ice, uh, it says like a bordering and isolated wetland instead of bordering comma and isolated wetlands. You mean like this? Perfect. <laughs> yeah um i don't really like the way that this is this is broken up um detained <laughs> detained is a weird word for there should be retained <laughs> i mean some of these are kind of like nitpicky things but um to your big question there and i'd be in support of splitting up the two uh, for sure stuff. okay i think that's pretty important yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm just making notes for our minutes. Um, okay, and um, so in terms of the content of these, like I didn't really pick these apart a whole lot um, because again, a lot of these are, um, they're not really changing substantially other than where it differs from the Wetland Protection Act. And that's where we want to point out those, those distinctions. Um, there's a couple really interesting things under BVW. <laughs> um, this is really interesting. So the characteristics of Amherst soils are different than almost every other town. And um, there are there are good reason for that. Um, and so they, they specifically call those things out. It becomes really interesting, like, you know, when we were out, for example, Michelle and Leroy, when we were out um, at the Mitchell farm where they were, um, there was that, that wetland that was sort of in the hay field and we were trying to distinguish that and we were looking at soils, I mean, some of these issues that are specific to Amherst soils um, that we didn't even really call upon a lot of this language for, which is interesting. Um, but in some cases, Amherst does have a, um, a very unique um, red parent material in the, um, and, and this is in certain parts of town that there's this red parent material. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that in the soils in Amherst. I definitely have, um, but just so that you guys are aware of that, uh, it's kind of interesting from a delineation standpoint why Amherst is unique and different. Is, is the soil itself red? Is that what it means? Yeah, and it makes it really difficult. Remember like um, the like oxidized rhizospheres that you can see yeah. when you're, um, um, it's, like a, it's like a depletion and um, oxygen depletion in the soil where you can easily detect wetland soils, but 
in soils that have that red parent material, it's extremely difficult to um, assess the wetland um, because to, to assess whether it's wetland or not because of that. So anyways, it's just a kind of interesting, interesting tidbit that's in here that's tied into this. Um, I just want to point that out and um, So, um, and we can, we can dig into this as well a little bit more as time goes on. This is, this is about where I left off on my edits. Um, but under our local bylaw, we have this 35 foot no touch zone. Um, and it's, it's actually, we get into it a little bit further down into the document. Um, but it occurred to me in, in reading these, particularly bank and BVW, but I mean, because um, vernal pools have a hundred foot no disturb. So like bank and BVW are two resource areas that have a hundred foot buffer. And so when you get within 35 feet, there's that no, no disturb or no touch zone. Um, but would we want to state in the bank and the BVW, um, maybe in the preambles or um, in the presumptions of significance, that the reason that we protect that 35 foot zone, the reason that it's really important to protect that 35 foot zone, like, Something to the effect of, and this is just me, again, sort of spitballing, but like work that is located within this very important buffer around resource areas is important to protect for the following reasons. Um, like it's, you know, likely to be detrimental to the resource, likely to alter the resource. Um, and do we want to incorporate some language like that into bank or BVW to make it stronger. Because right now, um, it's kind of a standalone section down at the end that just says 35 foot no disturb. <clears throat> just so that you guys know, as we get into the, the last, um, the final 15 pages, those are going to become really important. And those are going to be things that I really want us to talk about more. And actually, if you guys don't mind, I'll flip down to it right now, just for the sake of you guys seeing it. Um, because I, I do take issue with some of these. Um, and I think we should reconsider some of these. And, and so because likely we'll be digging into these in the next session and um, we're kind of coming down to the, the end of reviewing this document, I think we really need to think about this. And I apologize for all the markup because I think this makes it really difficult to read. But for a single family home, oh, I'm sorry, it's a 30 foot. There's a 30 foot no work distance from the resource area. And there's a 50 foot building setback limit. Um, for commercial, there's a 30 foot no work distance, but there's a 75 foot building setback. Okay. So keeping those things in mind. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of specifying in the resource areas, because this is the only place this is listed. And down below this, as you can see, these presumptions are rebuttable and may be overcome by a clear showing that the nature of the proposed work, special design measures and construction controls or site conditions will prevent alteration of the resource area. So people can overcome the, these setbacks if they choose by, you know, narratively explaining or putting in, you know, site design features that protect the resource. But if you go a little further down here, um, oh, there's, look at that interesting um, ground mounted solar that was installed as being 30 feet away, institutional mixed use, multifamily ground mounted solar, photo photovoltaics, 30 foot setback, 
that's really interesting um, that that was inserted. That was not by me. That was by former editors of this. But then um, parking lots. So yeah, so you can see they fixed that, those edits, like driveways used to be able to get closer. Parking lots used to be able to get closer and other roads used to be able to get closer, but they kind of made those all consistently 30 feet setbacks. Um, so I just wanted to point those out to you because, you know, they're trying to make them more consistent. It, what, what would happen before, <laughs> like, so with commercial development, for example, because the building has to be 75 feet away, they put the building 75 feet away, but they put the parking lot in between the building and the wetland. So there's a big parking lot there. And a lot of times, you know, the parking lot is like the area where they have all the stormwater features. And so they have like stormwater treatment and then the discharges go out right at that 30 foot distance from the wetland. Um, so you're discharging stormwater from a parking lot right into a wetland basically or within 30 feet of a wetland. Um, those setbacks, I think, are very significant to bank and to BVW. And so I just wanted to really plant a seed that we should start thinking about those. Do we want to change them? Do we want to keep them as is? Um, do we think that single family home structure setback being 50 feet is adequate? Do we think that commercial setback of 75 feet is adequate? Do we think driveway and parking lot setback of 30 feet is adequate? Are you posing the question? Or, <laughs> um, I mean, obviously it might depend on the circumstance and the situation, but um, generally just like a number doesn't cover um, entire circumstances that could be influencing wetland, like stormwater runoff, or the extent of vegetation, or I don't know, the condition surrounding the area, the hydrology, all of that stuff, right? So that's not contained or specified in just saying 30 feet. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer for that right now. I don't think I'm, I think I'd like to hear you discuss situations further, but Roy, want to chime in? Uh, Ralph, uh, I'm with you. I'm going to need some time to think about it, but uh, I guess in the same vein, the number can't capture a lot of the variables. So I would err on the side of the, the, the numbers being low, because there are other things we can be, we do look at as more important. Um, it's hard for me to tell. It looks like they're all edited from 25 to 30. Uh, I'd be all right with all of those. I wouldn't mind increasing the commercial industrial. Um, kind of like Michelle said, uh, I'd like to hear some more stories from you about how this really goes. But if you have that instance where commercial is building buildings but then putting parking lots behind them, uh, I'd be more comfortable changing restrictions on commercial industrial lots as opposed to driveways or utilities parking lots. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, the question comes down to what's more detrimental to a wetland. Is it a building or is it a parking area? Well, definitely parking areas, definitely commercial and industrial. Yes. It's bigger and it lasts longer. It's around longer. So but if somebody is like, yeah, impervious surface for sure. But like a house would have impervious surface and potentially like lawn fertilizers and, um, you know, their laundry <laughs> detergent and just like dog. Paint. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Michelle, because I have like is a side note that because in our orders of conditions, we have a standard condition that says, within a hundred foot buffer zone or riverfront area, you can't use um, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. And so it's a, an like excellent- that. I mean, we can't, we're, who's monitoring that? I mean, it's, it's in there, but homeowners aren't reading, like really though? Well, so, 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 so just using an example, right? Let's say somebody says, 
their property is literally right on top of a wetland. Let's say let's say they're the the wetland line runs through their lot and they're out there spraying chemlon, whatever the green chemlon, you know, the trucks that come out and spray hazardous chemicals all over the lawn to kill you know they put the little they put the little yellow signs up that say uh no pets or children uh you know hazardous pesticides have been sprayed here but they're spraying them right next to a wetland and i get a lot of calls from people saying my neighbor's property is is right on top of a wetland and they're out there spraying true green chemlon all over their their lawn right next to a wetland. And I say, well, it's in our general orders of conditions that if somebody files a permit, they then can't do that, but it doesn't say it anywhere in our regulations that they can't. Hmm. So it's an interesting point as we're talking about these setbacks. And that's why I wanna just get the kind of the juices flowing in terms of thinking about this now, because we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how to, um, you know, if we want to include these things, if we don't, you know, the setbacks, thinking about those things. But yeah, it's uh, they're all interesting points. Yeah, well, I guess off the bat, I'm with Roy that um, it, you know, increasing at least the in institutional mixed use, like commercial, just commercial, whatever, because they generally include a lot more impervious surface and car parking and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm wondering, like, I feel like this sort of needs a diagram because, so we have these numbers, but they're rebuttable. So like one strategy would be to like encompass all of the worst case scenarios and the most protective measure, which would be to increase all of them to 50 feet. And then based on individual circumstances, allow for um, less, you know, re removing some of that boundary or buffer. So if we have 50 feet and they come to us and they say, this is what we're doing. And we say, okay, we can like, you know, work that back to 30. So rather than starting small and not really having the ability to increase it, even when we would think that it would be in order to do so, um, have like a more protective measure that we could use our, um, you know, use the conservation commission to decide on reducing it that yeah well i mean and i think it's it's particularly interesting like the the solar because there's so much clearing required for it so like if you're talking about an untouched forest buffer around a wetland let's say what this is essentially saying is they can clear up to and beyond 30 feet for solar because um with solar you know, it can be up to the 30 foot boundary is what this is saying. And so then you're carving into that buffer that's protecting the wetland. Um, and so, yeah, I think if, if, our, if our regulations say you can do that, that's what people are going to do. And, and people are going to point to this and say, hey, your regulations say that we're allowed to do this. So then there's no saying, well, you've got to move back. You've got to move this back 10 feet or another 20 feet. You've got to be at least 50 feet away because if you're, you're within 30 feet, you're then potentially altering a resource area. And with a wetland, it might be changing the temperature of the, the wetland. It might be reducing the shading of a wetland. Um, so um just we we don't have to belabor it too much right now but um think about those things and we can when we start um getting a little further along on this we can talk about it but i think as it pertains to bank and and bvw these are these are extremely important numbers to keep in mind and whether we want to tie in some language into th the specific resource area um, I think is going to be really important for us to consider at this at this point in our review. Anyways, um, I don't. Uh, I feel like I'm a little bit less prepared today than I have been for past meetings for <laughs> because I've had such an intense meeting schedule this week, and also because. Um, uh, the town attorney canceled on me right before our meeting this morning, but um, I'm going to try to 
um, I guess I guess what I'd like to ask you guys is is if you envision continuing going through for the next 10 pages sort of as we have been and just get through the whole document, do you think that that makes sense for the next meeting? Just okay. talking yeah. about. Um, yeah, and again, like just having a chance to review it beforehand, I think would help. Um, and if there are specific sections you wanna discuss, maybe like throw that in the email so we can formulate some thoughts and have our discussion. Okay. Lil Roy, what do you think? Are you, do you have a uh, same format? Thing. Okay. What I might do is, and I was thinking about this, is send you guys Wetland Protection Act, um, the, the actual performance standards for each of the resource areas, and then our um, unedited sections of the local bylaws so you can kind of see them side by side um, if that would be helpful that's one of the things I had thought about but my first inclination is that would be overwhelming but yeah. if you could like maybe like section by section or just break it down because it's okay. language I'm not using I don't know maybe Leroy can handle it but that sounds sort of intimidating <laughs> all right well let me think about it let me think about it and I'll try to get yeah. you guys some Way I mean, to just compare I it. think like se like section by section. I could that sounds okay. realistic because I also okay. you know need to like budget time spent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I don't want to take any more of you guys' time. I very much appreciate talking this through. Okay. And look forward to talking more. We had no attendees, so I will. Let me just make sure. Um, nope, just us. So see you guys. I guess next week. And Closing this meeting at 9 12 1. <laughs> My clock is on different times. 103. <laughs> okay, see you guys. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Bye, guys. Take care.